Hello everyone. Uh, recently I did a mini restoration of a ZX AD, but I didn't really capture footage because I thought it's too simple uh, to make for an entertaining video. Uh, but then I published some photos uh, on social media and people started asking me what did I do, what parts did I use. So I decided to make a short video with whatever footage or photos I did have. And I will call it a tutorial so people don't expect this to be a highly entertaining uh, video. The first thing I did was to do a composite modification. This RF modulator, the original, was shot, was not working. So I removed the components from, from half uh, the can, half the original components, to create space for my modification. But this mod will fit with the original components in place on top of them. I have experience doing this, it will fit. You just have to disconnect the original re resistor from the RCA cable and connect the mod's resistor uh, instead. Uh, these are the values I used, they work for me. You need a high current uh, amplifying transistor, uh, like the BC33740, a BC457 uh, will not do, it's too low current. Two resistors, uh, you connect the collector of the transistor to five volts, the base is connected to the video signal, the emitter goes to ground via 680 ohm, down to 100 ohm would work, and via 33 ohm to the RCA cable. And if you do this, you get a clear image, uh, very sharp, high contrast, with some uh, jail bars, but that has nothing to do with the video circuit, it has to do with the coupling on the main board. Now, the original has a linear voltage regulator that you see there with a big heat sink because it produces a lot of heat. Now, the problem is the ZX80's case has no ventilation and it's tiny, so the heat produced inside tends to be one main factor for destroying components. So, I think it's worthwhile, even in a restoration, to remove the linear regulator like I did and replace it with a modern switch mode DC to DC converter that produces basically no heat. And that's what it looks like. I'm using a TSR12450. That's the correct orientation on the board, what you're seeing there. You get 9 volts on the left and the produced regulated 5 volts to the right with ground uh, in the middle. This will help save uh, the remaining chips by reducing the amount of heat inside the case. Now, I added an extra decoupling capacitor on the back side of the board. This is not really necessary according to the data sheet of the DC to DC converter, but as an abundance of caution, this board is not very well decoupled, so I added it. I also added this uh, transient, transient voltage suppression diode, which makes sure that if for whatever reason uh, the, the supply voltage of 5 volts goes higher, then the excess energy is drained to ground via, via this diode and doesn't damage the components. This is not original, but again, for, as a conservational uh, uh, procedure, it makes sense, it will help preserve the original components. And uh, finally, the two memory chips that you see in the center now, they are the ones that get the hottest on this board, together with the original CPU. Uh, so I added two heat sinks uh, to, to sort of relieve uh, the thermal pressure from these chips. I'm using proper thermal glue, not these double-sided stickers you can find on, on AliExpress, and that stuff doesn't work, it's not enough heat con conductive. Use proper thermal uh, glue uh, uh, and, and then the heat sinks will actually work and make things better, not worse. Now this is the original CPU. In my case, uh, it was shot. It was getting, you know, glowing hot and it was not working. The buses uh, were uh, floating, the address bus. So I had to replace it anyway. But even if it's not shot, even if the original is not shot, it may be worthwhile to replace it with a modern, currently manufactured CMOS Z80, which is still done. Uh, in my experience, the modern ones, which run a lot cooler, um, they can tolerate TTL level inputs, even though they are CMOS parts. They don't get confused with the levels on the data bus. Um, I'm using here a 10 MHz part. That's what I happen to have. A 6 MHz modern part will do just fine. It will be almost twice as fast as the original in terms of capabilities. Of course, it will run at the same speed because the crystal will be the same as the original. So you may consider replacing the CPU, even if the original is still OK, to reduce the heat uh, inside the case. I also recapped, there are two electrolytic capacitors. This is the 22 microfarad one that is already replaced. 
There is another one microfarad one next to the CPU. I have also replaced that one uh, for good measure. This is just normal recapping that if it can be done, should be done. And normal servicing. There are two sockets on the board. I clean both of them with a deoxid. You can use your favorite contact cleaner. And what I also like to do is, uh, while the socket is still wet with the, 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 the contact cleaner, I, I put the chip back in so its pins also get cleaned by the contact cleaner uh, during insertion. Now the keyboard membrane of the, the ZX8 is notoriously bad. You, might, you probably will want to change it. There are new ones available on eBay. It has a conducting surface on the back of each key that when you press down, it shorts two lines on the main PCB and there, thereby registering uh, a key press. You remove it just by you know, as if you were pulling out a sticker. It's very easy. But after you've done that, you have to clean uh, the contacts. Um, you see to the right those little spirals. Those are two lines rotating within each other. When you press a key down, you short those two lines and the CPU then registers uh, a key press. Those should be cleaned with IPA and contact cleaner as well. And if you've done all this, this is what the end result will look like. Uh, the composite mod will be hidden under the, the, the can. There is no RF modulator there, but uh, it will work as a composite output. It will be invisible. Um, the other modifications that you can see on that corner, they are more conspicuous. You don't have that big heatsink of the original linear regulator anymore, an extra dial, extra heatsinks. But even then, they are not too conspicuous either. Everything is black, everything's tucked on a corner of the board. The computer will largely still look much like the original uh, when it comes to the PCB. And then you will get a working ZX80 producing a clear, sharp, high contrast image on your TV. Uh, that's worthwhile. But of course, you want it to look good as well. And this is what it was looking like, <laughs> what it was looking like uh, originally, very dirty, very yellowed. I just did the usual stuff. I washed uh, and the, the, the case in warm water and, and soap um, quite thoroughly. The case was still yellow because of you know the yellowing you get over the years. So I did the mild retro brighting with this 12% peroxide cream that you can buy on Amazon. Um, I did it for like six hours in an afternoon. I just used a, a paintbrush and put the, the cream uh, around the the case and every half an hour I would go there and maybe refresh it a little bit. No need for plastics or anything. If you put enough, it will not evaporate. Um, and it worked very nicely. It removed basically all the yellow. There is only a hint if you pay attention. After that, I soaked it in 303 uh, protectant to prevent future yellowing and to re rehydrate the plastics again. They become brittle over time, especially with retro brighting. So 303 uh, uh, goes a long way uh, towards preserving the plastic as it looks like after uh, retro brighting. And I finished up with Renaissance uh, microcrystalline wax that was recommended to me by Jam Hamster on Twitter. It's a wax developed by the British Museum and it cleans the plastics and gives it a very nice sheen. Um, also smells very nice, <laughs> if you ask me. My girlfriend hates the smell. I really like it. And it, 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 go, it, it, it makes the board really look like almost better than new, or the case, uh, not the board. It looks almost better than new. It has a unique sheen to it. It's difficult to explain, but it's, it's very rewarding and gratifying. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison, and it definitely look um, a mile or two better than the original. It will make a much better impression uh, in my collection. I didn't put all the little uh, pins again because I still have to change the ROM. The original uh, owner uh, replaced the original ROM of the ZX80 with a ZX81 ROM that uh, doesn't fit the keyboard layout. So I have to replace it with a 2732. EPROM uh, programmed with the original uh, ZX80 ROM. Uh, this is a little picture by, by Grant Searle. Uh, he, here's the address where you can find the original, uh, where he compares the pinout of the 2732 that I'm going to use with the ROM, uh, the, the Sinclair ROM that comes with the ZX80. 
and this one here in the middle gives you the reference for uh, the signals as they are routed on the circuit board. So for instance, uh, this signal here, chip select 2, that's what goes on this pin uh, on the in the circuit board, and this one, address line 11. Uh, for comparison, there is also a, a 2532, it's a Texas Instrument EEPROM, which has a slightly different pinout. I don't recommend you try to use these. These are hard to find and very expensive, um, and even if you find them, it's even harder to program them, as I found out. Even if you use a, an expensive professional programmer like I have, it's it still uh, doesn't manage to program these devices, so just ignore this. Uh, this one you ignore. Let's use a 2732, which is still very common, very easy to find and program. And then we have to change uh, two pins. Uh, this pin here we have to lift from the socket, and this one as well, because uh, this is the enable. Uh, but on the board, we have address 11 going to this pin, so we have to lift it, and this is what the EEPROM expects to be address line 11, but on the board, we have the chip select, which is in fact the enable. So we want to lift this pin and route this signal there, and this signal there. We just have to find the correct uh, uh, vias on the board, and they are very nearby, uh, in order to uh, do this modification. And there's the programmed 2732 with uh, the two pins already lifted. It has the original ZX80 uh, ROM code, which matches the original keyboard layout. So now if I press a key, uh, what will appear on the screen will correspond to that key as opposed to the ZX81 keyboard, which is different. And in this case, we would have required uh, an overlay, but uh, with the original ROM, we don't need to do that. Now, just cleaning with IPA the two lifted pins, because we need to do a little bit of soldering there, two bodges, adding a little bit of uh, flux paste uh, um, that doesn't need to be cleaned, not conductive. And then we just solder the wires and put a little bit of heat shrink uh, around uh, to make sure the job is properly done. And the other end we solder into the appropriate um, vias on the board. So I'm giving you some close-ups, so if you're trying to do this, you know where to connect those pins. And the result is very discreet. I used green wire and black heat shrink. So if you casually glance at the board, you will not know that there is uh, this modification done in order to accommodate a 2732. It looks pretty seamless, as you can see there. And it works too, which is the most important thing. So if I type in a little program uh, there, um, when I typed, the keys did what was written on the keyboard and uh, the chip runs, so the new ROM is working. So this pretty much completes this little project, this little tutorial, and I hope you've enjoyed it and that you can do it yourself. And here's the final result. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I will see you next time. Thank you.